Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to this week's uh, College of Optical Sciences colloquium presentation. Today's speaker is Peter Smith from um, the University of Arizona's Lunar and Planetary Laboratory, one of our own distinguished graduates. Um, Peter is the Thomas R. Brown Distinguished Chair of Integrated Science and has recently been the principal investigator on the Phoenix mission to Mars that was led out here at the university. Um, over the past 25 years, he's participated in numerous planetary science missions, including the conceptual design for the descent imager that landed on Titan in 2005, and we heard a talk about that a couple of years ago. Um, the imager for Mars Pathfinder in 1997, the Mars Exploration Rovers that have been roaming Mars since 2004. Um, he got his master's degree from here in uh, a few years ago, and then in, and then very recently got his PhD. He received his PhD in optical sciences in 2009, and today he's going to be talking to us about the UA built space cameras. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I need some optics to see where the button is. <laughs> It's all a blur these days. Huh? It's on? Okay. Well, the UA uh, space cameras. I'm not going to talk about every camera built at the UA because that would uh, be a much longer lecture, just the ones that I've personally been involved with in some way. So, actually, I uh, started here in 19. 75, which is, uh, seems an awfully long time ago. And uh, I had come from the University of Hawaii where we'd built UV spectrometers to fly in sounding rockets just outside the Earth's atmosphere. You had about 10 minutes to observe the sun. Of course, you had to point to the sun, so that took some time. And then you took some observations, and the thing came back to Earth on a parachute. You jumped in a helicopter, went up and got it, pulled the film out and developed it and see what you have. Now, I recommend, if any of you are interested in space instrumentation, that you try and find a sounding rocket program because within a year or two, you can go through every aspect of uh, space instrument development. So it's a great training program. And if any of you are thinking of following in my path and building space instruments, really a good way to get started. But when I got here at the uh, Optical Science Center, I was given a job working for the uh, Pioneer Project. And the PI of the Pioneer Project was Tom Gerrels, who worked across the street. And at OpSci, we were doing image processing and some of the operations planning. So we had a, a pretty big team here working on that project. And I'll talk a little about that. Oops. Now, the next one. Uh, was my first job after graduating with Marty Tomasco across the street. And we were using the Optical Science Center to build an instrument to fly to Venus and to descend through its atmosphere on a parachute and to look in five different directions while spinning to try and understand where the solar energy was de being deposited in this cloud-thick atmosphere. Was it right at the top? Was it all the way to the bottom? How much made it to the bottom? Because without the solar energy getting to the bottom of the atmosphere, how did you heat the surface up to, uh, what is it, seven or 800 Kelvin? So <clears throat> we were very interested in the radiative transfer and the absorption of solar energy into Venus. And that instrument was built here in this building and calibrated. Uh, at that time, we had a uh, decommissioned, um, um, oh, what do you call it? Where did the Jews worship? It's a, anyway, there was a, a temple down the street that we had converted into a, a laboratory. <laughs> I can't remember the word. Huh? Synagogue, thank you. Synagogue. So there was a synagogue down the street that had been decommissioned. We had all our stuff in it. We had a little room there, and we're calibrating this instrument that went to Venus. <clears throat> it's very exciting for me because... Uh, when I started in this calibration uh, laboratory, I was just a temporary worker, you know, filling out a timesheet. And I was thinking, what I really want to do is to be a gemologist. And I had realized there's real money in gemology because you can go to the poor people and find the best stones and then sell to the rich. You know, it's just one of those classic schemes that's got to work. So, um, but I didn't, I, 
I got hooked on uh, space science because in the course of a couple of months, we calibrated the instrument, shipped it to uh, Lock, or, uh, Martin Marietta. They put it in a spacecraft. The spacecraft launched in August. It arrived to Venus in December, descended through the atmosphere. We had all our data instantly. And uh, within two months, we had a paper published in Science Magazine. And so within six months after being hired, I was published in Science Magazine. I thought, whoa, never mind being a gemologist. This is too much fun. So that's how I got started. Um, and then there was kind of a big jump to the, the 90s. So I'd, in the meantime, we had the Reagan years, which were not so good for space science. And uh, we eventually got back on track in the, in the 90s. I worked on a uh, Galileo probe that went into Jupiter's atmosphere. And my big break was uh, the imager for Mars Pathfinder, which was an instrument that developed out of the descent imager uh, for the Huygens probe, which I'll talk about both of those. Uh, and then we did s stereo imagers for and robotic arm cameras, trying to fly them first in the Mars Polar Lander, which ended up crashing into the atmosphere of Mars. Well, I guess it crashed on the surface, but it had trouble through the atmosphere of Mars and wasn't able to land safely. And so uh, after a big success with Pathfinder, we had the total failure with Mars Polar Lander. All of my other programs are canceled, and we had to start over again, eventually calling our next mission Phoenix because it was rising from the ashes of all the failed missions and uh, being sent to Mars as... Uh, um, kind of a, a hero of the old technology. <clears throat> we built a microscope for the Phoenix uh, project. And then uh, before that was actually selected, I got to work on the high-rise telescope, which is operated from right across the mall. I hope all of you have had a chance to go inside of that building. And No? It's right across the mall. Anyway, it used to be the old. It's right across from the um, uh, planetarium. So you can walk in there. There's no guard at the door. And uh, look around a little bit. They show the pictures. The pictures are coming down 12 a day from Mars, high resolution. I'll show a couple. And, uh, and now we're working on uh, Phoenix ended in 2008 after five months on the surface. Winter set in, and it wasn't able to uh, survive the winter. And now we're working on the um, OSIRIS-REx mission to an asteroid. This is a, a real important project for the university. The university has donated a building for us, which is about a mile from here. And uh, inside of this building, we have a great collection of meteorites collected by uh, Martin Kilgore, who is probably in Russia right now, scrounging around for little pieces of the Russian meteorite. OK, so that's, that's, uh, that's the history in a nutshell. and. Uh, We've learned a few things about designing space cameras, which I thought I'd share with you. Um, so you want to meet all your science goals, and you define your requirements. But be careful not to make them big or more s strenuous than you actually have to. Everything that you ask for that's better than is needed is going to be trouble later, I guarantee you. So you, you, you find out what you have to do and do a little bit better, but not a lot better. And uh, so stay away from the unnecessary add-ons, the wouldn't it be nice ifs, and uh, limit your resolution to only what you require. Do not add mechanisms particularly. The mechanisms are in depth to programs like this because you have to have them built on schedule. And if they're at all complicated, you run into lots and lots of problems. You say, well, I can do this in my laboratory very simply. What you can do in your laboratory is not what you can do in space. So uh, be very careful with mechanisms. So we don't use shutters. We don't have, well, except in one case, which I'll show. We try not to have focus mechanisms. And uh, we keep our interfaces very simple. <clears throat> now, optically, you have to worry about radiation in space. And some glasses are not rad hard. They, uh, they start to color, particularly in the blue. Uh, so you really have to be careful in your glass choice. And, and we're, um, uh, we spend a lot of time making sure that our glasses are not going to darken in space. We don't use cemented surfaces, only uh, separated components, because the cement is not always uh, doing what you think it's going to do after a long period of time in space. 
and especially with uh, large temperature extremes. We, uh, <coughs> we really try hard to minimize the scattered light and any ghosting or internal reflections. Um, we go with the largest F number we can stand, um, and we keep our contamination to a, a minimum. The, actually, the worst time for contamination on a, uh, a camera system is during launch. They put you in a, a fairing, you know, which surrounds your instrument, and they tend to have you pointing up. The fairing is filthy, so when you take off and the air kind of rushes out of the fairing, the dust comes falling down right on your lens. So there you are, instantly contaminated, right on takeoff. You'd had the most cleanest instrument for four years before, and now it's a mess. So we have all kinds of special procedures to try and keep that from happening. <clears throat> Detectors, of course, are the other important part of a camera. Um, we want good quantum efficiency, especially in the wavelengths we care about. We always try and get Andy blooming because no matter what you do, there's always a glint off of something that's sending light all over your detector. Um, we have thermal control of the focal plane because our temperatures are usually, you know, very wide um, uh, specifications, especially on Mars. You can go from minus 120 C up to plus 10 and you have to survive. Well, actually you have to work it in the lab too, so it goes up to plus 25 C. And so that range is, is pretty extreme and you have to work throughout the range. So we try and control the detector to a, a fixed uh, temperature if we can. On uh, uh, Pathfinder, we actually heated it so that it kept, we kept it at minus 10 C. So when it got very cold, it was always at minus 10. And when it got hotter, hotter than minus 10, we didn't have a cooler, so it just went a little bit over and the properties would change very slightly. Um, let's see, we want high signal to noise. The higher the better because digging signal out of noise is never fun and it's, uh, it takes an inordinate amount of time to try and do that. Uh, you, you don't solve many problems with data analysis and data reduction. You really want the best data possible, so you go for the high signal and noise observations. Wide range of exposure times, and uh, the instrument scales with the pixel size. I'm sure you all know this, but the smaller you can make your pixels, the smaller your instrument, the less mass, probably the less power to control the temperature, and uh, the happier the spacecraft team's gonna be with your instrument. So. Uh, make the pixels as small as you can, but if you make them too small, you lose your dynamic range. The pixel can't hold that much charge, and uh, so you have to balance dynamic range against pixel size. Okay, so to go back in time to when I first came to this building, um, we had one pixel cameras. This imaging photopolarimeter has one pixel. <laughs> And what we do is we allow the spacecraft to spin, and then we had something called the clock angle. So we would scan the clock angle, and we would have a start time, start taking data, turn it off, go all the way around, start taking data, change the clock angle, go all the way around, and line by, oh, pixel by pixel, we would put together an image. And actually, we could do pretty well with this. And in this case, we had two colors, so there was two pixels for the colors. And we also had uh, Wollaston prisms that split the light into a P and S polarization. So we ended up with four pixels, but you know, basically it's a one pixel camera and uh, we could get the polarization. So we could take really nice pictures. There's Titan and Saturn and a picture of Jupiter. This is the first flybys of these objects in the solar system. First time uh, any spacecraft had ever gone that far away from Earth. And it was a very exciting time. We actually controlled the spacecraft when we went by Saturn from the Ames Research Center up in the, the Bay Area. And they had a room for this operation center that was kind of like a ship. It came to a point in the front and kind of a flat space in the end. And we had a little place at the end of this ship. And we spent all our time staring at little tiny screens that had pictures of Saturn on it or pictures of, of the moons coming by. And for six weeks, I stared at those screens till I thought that ship was really in space. You, after a while, you lose your sense of reality, you know. 
I think we all do. We look at screens too much, and we lose that sense of, you know, where we really are. And uh, so we all felt like we were on our on our way to Saturn. It was really quite exciting. <clears throat> and all of this uh, equipment was designed and built here in this building. So the uh, next instrument I want to talk about is one where we kind of went the other way from simplicity and just the one pixel camera to the most complicated mess of instruments you've ever seen in your life. This, this is about the size of a shoebox. There's 13 optical instruments crammed into this thing with two detectors. So we're sharing the detectors between multiple instruments. Um, we have, it's a little hard to see because they're painted op optical black. There's a down-looking imager, a side-looking imager, a side-looking imager, and a, a medium imager in between. And the idea is the, the probe, as it descends through the atmosphere of Titan on a parachute, has little veins. Well, they have to go the same way. It sort of drills its way down and spins. And we had a, a sensor that could sense when the sun came by, so we would have a zero point on the spin. And then we'd time our pictures all the way around. And even though we had a very short, very small number of pixels, and we had cameras that would look at the bottom 90 degrees, and we would just scan around as we went down drilling into the atmosphere. And this was a great plan. We had all the, uh, the images put out onto two channels that were sent back to the spacecraft for lead, relay to Earth. They couldn't relay directly to Earth. as the antenna was too small. So uh, when we actually did the mission, we're spinning down, taking the images, feeding them out on the A and B channel, sending them to the spacecraft. Guess what? Somebody in between JPL and the European Space Center had forgot to turn on one of the channels. So we lost half our images. So instead of getting this nice, you know, seamless set of images all the way around. We got like every other one. And then <laughs> we'd have to put them together, the ones that were down, you know, a kilometer lower and then a kilometer below that. So the image processing became quite complex. Fortunately, we had a, a German scientist across the street that devoted an entire year of his life to putting that together. And he made a great movie that shows the descent of the Huygens probe through the atmosphere. But uh, the guy that really lost was the guy doing wind measurements. That All his data was on the one channel that wasn't turned on. I've never seen a man more outraged in my life when he was just realizing that they just didn't turn on the receiver. Oh, was he mad? Only 15 years of his life. Here's another picture of this thing. We actually had a calibration sent, sent, uh, um, system and we sent calibrated light, the same light to all the cameras using little fibers. So we would feed into the, the front of each camera and each spectrometer light from uh, a common sort of integrating sphere. And we'd have the same light going into every camera to tie them all together so we knew uh, the calibration of the instrument. Well, drawing these things in uh, the early 90s, was not easy, you know, 3, 3D models of the, where that fiber actually goes and the design of it and the length of it and how it fastens in. The uh, mechanical engineers were tested to their limits. We also had a, um, a lamp, a flashlight. And as we got close to the surface, Titan has a methane atmosphere. And so methane is very absorbing. So by the time you get through uh, the, the depth of the Titan atmosphere, a lot of the light is absorbed out by the methane. So if you want a spectrum of the surface and not the spectrum of the atmosphere, you have to bring your own light source and light it with your source, and then you can get the full spectrum plus whatever uh, methane-changed uh, light comes through. And that's important because we're looking for organic material. It has the same absorption spectrum pretty much as methane, so you have to you know, you'd basically be in, it'd be impossible to find the organics if you didn't bring your own light source. <clears throat> so this is how we used one detector to f to uh, feed all three cameras. We had an optical fiber. So on the left side, you see the three lens elements. Uh, you can kind of see the lens cells a little bit. 
And then there's kind of a, a long um, part that goes all the way back to here, and the detector's back there, so the lenses are up there. And what's, what's inside of that, um, well, it's inside the detector. There's the detector. It's got frame transfer, so it transfers from that black area down to the white area, which is a covered part of the detector. So all the, the light uh, irradiated pixels are quickly transferred and then slowly read out. Quickly transferred, slowly read out. So that's how we do the shutter. And uh, the, on the left, you see the storage array below. And above, you see those different areas. We've split the detector into the three imagers. And we've added an upward-looking and a downward-looking uh, spectrometer. And up at the top, there's four little bars. That is a solar oil detector. So to measure the solar oil as we scan through it, we have detectors for that. So we are using this one tiny little chip with three imagers, two spectrographs, and uh, four sol solar oil detectors. Solar oil being the, f the um, polarizations on either side. <laughs> and red and blue, two polarizations, so we got four. So there's a, a drawing of the fiber. And this fiber was very difficult to make because you had to make the three imagers, you had to make the spectrographs welded in, and the four solar orioles. It was a, a real challenge. We had a, a company called Collimated Holes. And Collimated Holes made the uh, fiber bundle. And there was one guy who could really do this right. He was able to focus like nobody else. His name was Crazy Larry. And Crazy Larry lived in a trailer out in the parking lot behind the building. <laughs> and so Crazy Larry had finally put together our flight model of this thing, left it on his desk with a note, and the note said he was checking himself into an institution. <laughs> and his trailer was gone. Well, the fiber wasn't quite right. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy Larry was gone, checked into an institution, and we were left with a fiber that wasn't quite to the design, and we had to work around it because there was no other way to make this fiber, so we were, you know, we had to adjust our, our design a little bit. Um, this chart shows the effects of radiation. To get this uh, Saturn system, you have to go by Jupiter, which is highly radioactive. Or, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, that's radioactive. Anyway, the high radiation flux at Jupiter. And you can see uh, this is the amplitude of our dark noise. And uh, this is by line. So as you scan a, a pixel down, it has, spends more time going down from the top than it does going from the bottom. So you can see when we, before we launched uh, halfway to, to Saturn. And then when we got there, the dark counts going up, up, up as it's being impacted by the radiation, particularly around Jupiter. The other uh, things that made it difficult to reduce the data is that the fiber came right up next to the chip. And the fiber is made in little bundles of fibers. And you can see uh, that there's kind of an egg crate. Egg crate? Is that right? Kind of a, 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 a fence-like pattern or egg crate pattern and a lot of black dots. The black dots were to prevent crosstalk. You, you put little black fibers between the, the individual um, uh, optical fibers, and they absorb light so you don't get crosstalk between the fibers. But sometimes uh, they don't work just the way they're supposed to, and you get these little speckles. So all of this stuff had to be taken out of the images. This was our flat field. <clears throat> And again, you can see we're only 512 pixels by 256 pixels. And over here would be the spectrometers and the solar oriole. But despite all these difficulties, we managed to image the surface of Titan for the first time ever. And we saw a scene on the left that looked very much like the coast of Italy with the little river system. This would be where um, methane has rained down to the surface and flowed along an icy mountain range because the mountains are made out of water ice, and flowed down into something that looks like a lake. This is definitely a shoreline. And now we know there are many lakes on Titan, and uh, probably with methane, ethane uh, liquids in them. And on the right is the picture taken after landing. 
And those little boulders are rock, rocks made of ice. And they are rounded because they've been flowed down through that river system, and they look like river rocks. Very interesting place. <clears throat> OK, I'm going to talk a little about the Pathfinder camera. The Pathfinder camera came from an opportunity to propose a camera uh, for Mars on the Pathfinder mission. Pathfinder mission was meant to be an engineering mission, not a science mission. And they were going to build a whole series. It was pathfinding for a series of landers that were going to provide a network around Mars. It'd be like 20 of them landing all around the planet, providing weather data and imaging and so forth. And this was the first one. <clears throat> so uh, I had a, a, an idea that we could take all the parts that we were designing for the descent imager to Titan and refashion them because now we had space qualified detectors and we had lens systems and we had a lot of stuff designed. If we could refashion it into a, um, a Mars camera, we might have a real advantage over others who hadn't had the opportunity to develop um, space qualified hardware. <clears throat> and so we used the same CCD as the uh, descent imager for the Titan mission, frame transfer so you didn't need a uh, shutter. We used a very uh, large F number, F18, is a simple cook triplet lens where we could uh, keep the distortion very low. And um, we had large depth of field, so we didn't have to focus. We were in focus from half a meter to infinity, so we didn't need a focus mechanism. Uh, our field of view wasn't very big, but the whole idea is to do little postage stamp pictures and then sew them all together at the end. So you end up with a panorama of thousands of pixels when you have a camera that is only 1 16th megapixels. You can't even buy one of those today. <laughs> Your cell phone has more pixels than that. So um, it had about 1 milliradian per pixel resolution. 12 filters, so we could actually do a, a visible spectrum of the surface using the filters. And uh, they were on two different wheels, one for each eye, but we put them on one shaft so we'd only have to have one motor instead of two. We had a diopter lens to look at things that were closer than half a meter, like the top of the deck. And so by putting a diopter lens in the filter wheel, it's very much like putting your glasses on, uh, you could look at the close-up um, objects. Solar filters for viewing the sun directly. They had, um, uh, I think, very very low transmission and a very tiny band pass. So I think they're just five nanometers wide and and had a very high optical depth or high optical thickness. Um, <clears throat> and then we used the two eyes for stereo views. We had data compression, and if you pointed the camera straight down and looked at its uh, neck, so to speak. It was fully dust protected because it actually had eyebrows. So when it looked down, the eyebrows protected it. We needed a vent, so we put in a vent and we made it a little curve. So we used it for our logo. It had sort of a personality. It was called Imp. But when you sewed all the pictures together, there might be, you know, a hundred pictures taken to get this scene. You need the three colors, and you need to step it along back and forth. And uh, we saw some very interesting rocks. And this is a little scary because we were going to drive a rover on here, you know, and those rocks looked awfully huge. Turned out they were only about this big, but they look huge. <clears throat> and there was a nice hill in the background. We could stretch our images and get pretty high resolution. You could see um, a lot of detail in the tracks, and you could see these wind tails where you could tell the direction the wind was blowing by the, the way the sand was pushed behind the rocks in the downwind side. And uh, the other interesting thing is you see the rock in the upper right has two tones. And Mars's atmosphere is a lot different than the Earth. The, um, the part around the sun, the oil around the sun, is actually very bluish, and the sky surrounding is quite reddish. So there's a, almost a two-tone sky. So when you get direct illumination, you get kind of a bluish tinge. And when you get kind of glancing uh, or a skylit um, 
lighting, you get kind of a reddish tinge. And so for a while, we thought the rock was really like a two-tone Chevy, you know. It had <laughs> red and, and blue surfaces, but that was not the case because they changed with time of day. So we drove our rover off of a little ramp on a solar pedal and uh, off to a, a rock. And we were, of course, made fun of in the paper as the worst rover drivers in the world because we ran into the one rock that was big enough to cause it damage. But actually, we're measuring the rock. <laughs> we're, there's a little sensor on there to try and get its uh, composition. But, uh, you know, Mars has been devilishly difficult to understand. The rocks are basaltic. The dust is kind of some sort of nanophase iron and it's hard to get a handle on Mars you know you don't have the kind of wonderful variety of rocks we have on the earth a lot of sedimentary features and and that kind of thing it's just an old lava field so but there were some possibilities there's clearly something very bright just under the surface and um, so one hopes that well you know, you kind of live for that one measurement. You can't explain it all. And we go there just hoping, you know, we get something that is so interesting that, um, you know, the powers that be at NASA will finally get some sense and really make a big push for trying to understand what Mars is about. We also um, <clears throat> had developed a way to do super resolution. And so we could actually get better resolution than you might expect from a single image where you might get at the very best maybe two pixel um, resolution. You certainly can't get one pixel resolution. That's against the, uh, the sampling theorem and I'm sure you guys have all learned about that. So two pixels would be the absolute best. Normally you get three or four pixels is where your resolution limit is. But if you take many pictures and just move the camera slightly, then you can put them back together, you have to line them all up again, and now you can get a little better than the pixels, and we called that super resolution, and you could do stereo, and if, if you had a pair of the right glasses, you would see that this is a very nice picture, but I didn't bring any glasses, so you're going to have to take my word for it, but we had a lot of fun uh, doing that kind of thing, and the mission, we knew the mission was a success after it was over when uh, the postage service uh, issued a stamp and they charged three dollars for this stamp so we we knew this was a good mission you know they put it on their high price stamp and not the cheap well there aren't any cheap stamps anymore but <laughs> maybe postcards it's not a postcard stamp this is a real um, um, well what is it what kind of stamp is it and it's some package stamp I guess okay so that was Pathfinder in 1997 and I wanted to talk a little about the instrument that's sending back pictures from Mars. It's across the street that, again, I'll encourage you to go across the street and take a look. And they take images. Uh, it's a half-meter telescope orbiting uh, oh, 250 kilometers above the surface. has a, a pixel resolution about this big, 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters. And so they can probably resolve things about three times that size. They could resolve, you know, maybe three elements in this desk and see it from 250 kilometers away. Unless there's dust in the sky, which there often is. And uh, this is a picture of, um, let's see, which crater was this? Victoria Crater? Anyway, this is where one of the rovers went. And the rover's actually in the picture. And uh, it has these scalloped edges around it. It made a very beautiful picture. And uh, the interesting thing to me is how much data they are sending back with these high-resolution images. And they have been working since 2006, orbiting, taking 12 images a day. And each image is done with a push-broom scanner. So they scan. They can go up as long as they can until the instrument heats up to the point where they have to turn it off because they're cranking out pixels at a great rate. They're moving along at 30 centimeters a pixel, and so they have to, the amount of current it takes to pull that charge off the detector is enough to heat the, the, um, the focal plane array, and at some point they have to stop and turn it off. But uh, check this out. This, is a, this slide's a couple years old, and it shows how many terabytes have come back 
from that one instrument, basically, compared to all the other missions that have been flown. And this is a couple years old, like I say. I think they have 50 or 60 terabytes of images across the street. So guaranteed, no one person has ever looked at all those images. <laughs> So if you're interested in Mars, you can download images and you can feel like you're the first person to ever look at some of them. And, uh, of course, I can't tell you which ones haven't been looked at. But, uh, you know, if you have an interest in image processing or, or working on Mars images, these are all available online on the HiRISE site. So you just look, do a search on HiRISE and you'll find it right, right away. Wonderful pictures, huge amounts of data. And the, camera is uh, quite large. It's, like I say, a half-meter telescope and um, <clears throat> has a couple of electronics boxes. has to be really supported very well in the structure and um, um, a good metering structure in the sunshade. Didn't have a, um, a lens cap. Here's an actual picture of it as they're getting ready to install it on the spacecraft. But I wanted to tell you a little about the optical design on the in interior, and maybe you all know this already, but I, I'm guessing some of you don't, so I'm, I'm going to go through it a little bit. <clears throat> there's a Cassegrain telescope, and then there's a third mirror, the tertiary, it says, at the bottom, and a couple of fold mirrors, and basically it's a three-mirror anastigmat. Are you all familiar with that? Yes, no, maybe? Yes. Okay, well, then I won't spend much time on it. So it's a three-mirror anastigmat, and um, optically it looks something like this. And you have a um, parabolic mirror, and you have two spheres. But the, two, the clever thing is the two spheres, one is used concave and one's convex, so one has the negative aberrations and one has the positive, and they can actually subtract each other. And you can get very good imaging with, uh, um, with this system. And you have a, a field stop here. And there's also, because of this mirror, a Leo stop, which is very important for canceling out the scattered light in the system. And so they have very low scattered light, which is quite important when you're looking at an extended object and trying to see detail in the shadows in the middle. <clears throat> and the, um, the tertiary mirror, TM, um, also magnifies the um, um, image back to a, a focal plane. And we're looking at a, a slit, basically. So that EM there would allow a slit of light to come in. And it would be put across a, a line of detectors. And that line of detectors is being scanned along the surface of Mars in what we call a push broom approach. So there's uh, the uh, focal plane array with its uh, line of detectors. They have each, each uh, detector element is 2,000 by 128. And the 128 is the, um, what's called TDI. So they're scanning the pixels along at the same rate you're going along the surface. So you'll get a, uh, a, a feature will show up on one of the pixels and it'll be scanned along at the rate you're scanning the surface. And therefore, you get 128 times the uh, integration time you would get if you only had a single row of pixels. See what I mean? So you got, otherwise, you're going by so fast, the exposure time's so short that you really can't get good signal noise. So they have, they boost it by 128 times by scanning it along. And you have to line the thing up with your tracking direction. So um, it's a, there's a little bit of trick to it. But they've figured it out. And they actually, not only have the 20, or I'm sorry, the 10 sensors, each one with 2,000 pixels, but they have four others that have color filters over them. So now they've got, for the strip in the middle, they've got three colors. And uh, you get long strips of data like shown on the lower left. First thing they looked at was the collection of debris that we've put down on the surface of Mars. And there's the polar, uh, uh, the Pathfinder parachute and um, uh, back shell and the Spirit, the Opportunity, the two Vikings. You found all of those. 
but he has never found Mars Polar Lander, which disappeared and crashed in the southern uh, polar region. So that is something that's still being looked for, but chances are slim, I think. Then they can turn around and look out and see um, the moon Phobos, which is really quite amazingly beautiful. A huge crater, I think it's called Stickney Crater, and uh, all kinds of discolorations. These moons are thought to be captured asteroids because they have, for all the world, their spectral qualities are those of asteroids in the asteroid belt. <clears throat> then with the 3D imaging that you can get by scanning, taking a picture of a feature from one side, and then when you come by again, you take it from the other side, and you can make a stereo image, and they can actually get height information, and they can see some of the layered terrain, and really a very beautiful rendition which allows them to kind of make an attempt at understanding the underlying uh, structures uh, geologically. There's active features on Mars. This is a picture of a, a dust devil. And um, there's a um, uh, kind of a groove that's left behind as it transitions across the surface. And then there's the shadow of the thing. And from the shadow and the sun angle, you can tell how high the dust devil is. And they tend to be several kilometers high, five kilometers or even, uh, even more, and two or three hundred meters in diameter. If they look in the polar region, there's uh, layered terrain. And sometimes, if you're lucky, you can actually see a, a landslide. This is a steep slope on the left, ice at the top, and then layers of uh, uh, kind of the various seasons uh, on Mars left behind underneath. And it's kind of unstable, very steep slope. And every now and then, they can actually see an avalanche um, down the side. So an exciting place. They got lots of images. So take a look. And then uh, for Phoenix, 2008, May 25th, we had a, a big party here for the landing. We ran this mission from Tucson at our operations center on Drachman and Sixth. Um, landed the old-fashioned way using thrusters. There were no airbags, no sky cranes. This is the way that Viking landed in 1976, and I think it's uh, worked very well for us. <coughs> the uh, high-rise telescope actually took a picture of us while we were landing on our parachute, and that box, uh, this box here, shows the parachute, which is blown up down here. And it's a little hard to tell on this projection, but you can actually see the lanyards that are holding the parachute to the back shell. Another picture in the upper left shows the, the heat shield is in the picture, too. We, we jettisoned the heat shield after, land, after um, releasing the parachute. And they actually got a picture of it falling away underneath. And uh, after landing, there's a picture of us on the surface with our solar panels open. So this U of A camera really is uh, quite a remarkable. They also photographed the um, MSL, or the Curiosity parachute, as it was descending, and have taken quite a number of pictures of it on the surface. OK, so the Phoenix mission was all about digging down to ice in the polar region. Uh, basically, we were convinced there was going to be permafrost. We wanted to dig down and try and understand the properties of it. So we had no wheels. We had only um, uh, an arm, and the arm was going to take samples and put, them on, put samples into instruments on our deck where we could do analyses. So this is what it looked like. We had solar energy powering us, and uh, we also had a weather station. There's our camera up on a mast. There's actually three cameras on here. The one on the mast, the surface stereo imager. There's the camera on the arm. And there's a microscope in one of these boxes, all uh, designed pretty much at the university. So the rot robotic arm camera is uh, shown right up here, strapped to the arm, where it can see inside the scoop when you turn the scoop around. And uh, it kind of tracks the uh, digging operations of the um, um, of the robotic arm. It also had its own lamps. It could take pictures at night. 
But the most amazing thing this camera did was to look back underneath the spacecraft after we landed to make sure that we were stable on the surface. And we saw the ice we were looking for exposed by the thrusters. See the thrusters in the top of the picture? They have blasted away the soil. And so we found out first thing in the first week of being there that the ice was only a few inches deep. And uh, when I show you the panorama, just hold it in your head. As far as you could see, the ice is just a couple inches below the soil. And that you have to realize the entire northern plains, most likely, are, are in exactly this fashion. You, you could basically, if you had a, a leaf blower, you could blow away all the dust in the northern plains. You'd have an ice cap. So it's very interesting to see that. <coughs> So here's the picture of the, the surface. Uh, you know, I, I was told by several people this is the most boring picture they've ever seen. And frankly, it's, it's not tr absolutely thrilling uh, scenery. And this is done on purpose. At, at the Jet Propulsion Lab, they have risk aversion like you would not believe. <laughs> if you led your life at the way they lead their spacecraft lives, you would, you would never get out of your house. So, uh, so we had to find the one place in the northern plains where there were no boulders, no slopes, no <laughs> nothing of any interest, but we had to find a place where we thought there was ice under the surface. So we managed to succeed, but of course the consequence is the pictures are absolutely a parking lot in there. <laughs> but when you dig under the surface just a little bit, there's the ice. So. We were happy. Could have been worse. But you also, it's not as flat as I make it sound. There's these little grooves around. And so the, the surface has been expanding and contracting because the ice, uh, uh, when you change the temperature, it'll expand and contract. And it actually shapes the ground around it. And over time, you can actually get a uh, almost like a convection current going. And so, uh, you know, it's kind of a interesting place if you like uh, permafrost geology and, and some of us did. So we did uh, a terrain model using our, the two eyes of our camera and we could make a pretty accurate terrain model and these are those little mounds, the polygons that form from the expansion and contraction of ice. So we built, uh, dug trenches in the peaks and we dug trenches in the valleys and we could compare those different types of terrain features uh, for the ice underneath. Now the robotic arm camera is designed to look in the scoop, so this is what it looks like in the scoop. You see a little white material, could be ice, probably ice, but it could be salt too, so you can't be 100% sure. But one thing we are sure of is it's clumpy. See these big clumps up there? We had instruments that had ports with screens on them. So the the, the size of the particles is very small, just a few microns, and the screen sizes were a millimeter. However, if you clump it together, it won't go through the screens. So some of the screens had motors to shake them a little bit, which was fine, except they were shaking them up and down. <laughs> and the, the clumps didn't mind at all, you know. There's like a magic fingers bed. They were just, you know, very happy. We needed to shear them like like you would sift flour or something. But we never had any material like that in our laboratory, so we were surprised by it. We could also do a close-up with this robotic arm camera. This is one of those cameras we actually put focus on because we had to look close and we had to look far and we couldn't seem to do it any other way. So we, this is um, looking only 11 millimeters in front of the camera. And we could also look to infinity. And the, what we did is put a double Gauss lens and ran it back and forth on a track. And we could actually have good imaging all the way out to infinity. So these are the clumps that I'm telling you about. <laughs> it doesn't make a nice, you know, porous, uh, uh, sandy kind of material. And the microscope, uh, up in the upper left, you can see the arm dumping some soil on this little groove right here. Inside of that groove is the top of this wheel. These are the sample holders. And then you can spin the wheel down so it's vertical and 
move it back in front of the camera. So you can see we've dumped soil on the thing, spun it around, moved it back to the camera. The camera has lights there, and we can get color pictures. And this is uh, on a magnetic surface, so you're holding any magnetic material. And you see these 100 micron little, almost football shaped grains. Football shaped. And that's because they've been blown by the winds and spun around and knocked all the corners off. And uh, so this is definitely wind blown material. Speaking of winds, we had a wind sock where we put a mirror. We look at the mirror, and the mirror looks straight up the windsock, which would blow around. You could see a picture over there, and a little cross up there. So you could see by the cross and by how far it had moved, what direction and what speed the wind was going. This was a poor man's wind sensor because we run out of money. And uh, so we were kind of scrounging around a little bit to make extra measurements. Otherwise, you have no idea what the wind's doing. <clears throat> Turned out to be important. We had a, a beautiful sample we collected. We had a sample collection chamber, and we poured it. And the next day, we looked with the camera, and the sample had been blown by the wind and was scattered over the deck, and none of it went into the, the port. Mars is not easy. OK, so <clears throat> the last camera I'm going to talk about is the, um, the OSIRIS-REx camera suite, the OCAMS. And it has three cameras, which are shown here in this drawing. Polycam, which is a big telescope, 8-inch telescope, being built in this department. Uh, map cam, it's about one-fifth the focal length. And the sample camera, one-fifth of that. So we have three cameras. And these cameras are um, designed so that if you look at the resolution versus the range to the surface, um, we, we track in on the polycam, the big telescope, when we see it as a point source in the sky, and it helps us navigate to find the asteroid. And then we transfer over to the map cam for doing mapping. And it maps at about uh, one meter resolution. But if one of these cameras breaks, you can always back away from the surface and do the same thing with the polycam. So they have not redundancy, but they have overlapping capabilities. So the two cameras are really supporting each other in that way. And then we get down closer to look at the surface. We actually can refocus this telescope all the way down to 200 meters. We actually broke on one of my rules and designed a focus mechanism. And now we can get down to 200 meters, and we see sub-centimeter sub -centimeter resolution and um, that allows us to know that the particles on the surface are collectible in our, our little uh, device that we're going to be collecting particles with. So we want to know before we touch the surface that it's sampleable. So this is, um, uh, I find it quite interesting to take a telescope and use it as a microscope. But uh, I don't know if others have done that. Maybe they have. I guess you can refocus cameras and look at birds and things. but. But uh, I don't know that one's ever been flown in space. And then the map cam can come down to about, um, what's that, 100 meters. And it has a diopter lens inside of its filter wheel, so it can actually image from 30 meters. And when we finally get down very close, we can use our sample camera to watch the entire sampling process at um, kind of slow video rates. And we'll record the whole thing as we come down and grab a sample and move away. The sampling device looks like the um, air cleaner in a car. It's about this big, big filter around there. It has three tanks of gas. And as you push this thing to the surface, it fires the gas jet down and blows material into the filters. So it only comes down, touches for five seconds, blows the gas, collects the sample, and then pushes away. So this is not like a Mars landing where you're coming in at 13,000 miles an hour. This is a 500-meter asteroid that you're just kind of floating down at a few centimeters a second. And so you can do things on this asteroid you can't do on Mars. Nitrogen. We're very concerned about 
contaminating our sample because we're going to look for subtle organic molecules, you know, in the subtle meaning might be parts per million or a few hundred parts per billion. <clears throat> so we don't want to contaminate a gas that blows down. So we have to be very careful about that. So I thought I'd just talk a little about the three cameras. This is the one you're building uh, in the basement here. And um, it's just a rich accretion telescope with a focus mechanism moving a lens up and down. So it's fairly simple, but we're having a considerable amount of trouble designing it. <laughs> it's, I think it's going pretty well now, though. And um, this system right here is the radiator that keeps the um, detector at a constant temperature. So we radiate the heat out into space, and we have a heater on the detector to balance the, the loss of heat to space. And we can keep it at constant temperature. Um, okay. And then the map cam has five lens elements, has a filter wheel with a, a diopter lens for focusing. It has four color filters and uh, a panchromatic filter. And um, um, that's a pretty simple camera, actually. Uh, not much to it. Just lens and a detector. And then the sample camera is actually cocked off at an angle because we have to look at this thing from the side as it goes down. And the, the biggest challenge we've had so far is that the sampling head is right in the field of view of our sample camera. Right there. It has to be because we're looking at the actual operation. And it is covered with uh, MLI, multi-layer ins in insulation. That's the uh, highly reflective material. So they f mold this around the thing and up the arm and everything. And of course, when the sun hits it, which of course it will, it's blinding. <laughs> and it over overwhelms our anti-blooming channels and uh, floods the detector with, with light. So we're working with Lockheed Martin to try and get them to blacken and take all the specular reflections off of their coatings. It's not something they like to do. So this is an example of an asteroid. This is Itakawa, and it's about the same size. So there's no guarantee these things, because of their low gravity, there's no guarantee that they're spherical or even close to spherical. So the first thing we have to do is, is get a, a shape model for our, our uh, asteroid. And you can see in some conditions, uh, when you're making a line from the center and trying to put latitude and longitude, you can actually cut through the surface three times. So what's the latitude and latitude uh, you know, of that, that line? It's, uh, it's, it can get very complicated. And because these things are so small, they are no longer pulled towards the center and have a, a solid core. They are just kind of loosely held together um, boulders. And you can see the boulders floating around a, there in a, a matrix of smaller material, just kind of loosely held together. You know, if you're strong enough, you could just work your way right through the thing. So uh, it's, it's an interesting object and certainly a challenge. And uh, we're going to bring back a sample and, and keep it in a pristine state, land it in uh, Utah, and then take it to uh, the Johnson Space Center to be analyzed. And we hope to get maybe two kilograms. It's about two handfuls. And that will be enough to keep scientists working uh, for years. The, the hard part I just found out the other day is when you blow this material into a filter, you can have tiny little grains all through the filter material. And they want every grain to be picked out and cataloged. And the grains can be 10 microns in diameter. So some poor bugger is going <laughs> to have the job of finding the grains in, the, in this filter and plucking them out and cataloging them. Won't be me. And uh, with that, uh, you know, we have U of A cameras really all over the solar system now. We've done a pretty good job of spreading them around among the planets and asteroids. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Peter. We have time for questions. Easy questions. Easy questions. <laughs>